Uh, and what is your sense of SARMs in general? Do you think they're relatively safe or do you have any experience with them? Yeah. I mean, I know people that have done them and I tried them myself. They do behave like anabolics. However, they, they are not like steroids without the steroid side effects as people originally were hoping. Right. They do have the same hepatotoxicity or liver toxicity because they are oral. Oral. And they also will shut down your own endogenous production of testosterone because your brain senses them as testosterone or testosterone-like molecule and decreases the signal to your testicles to produce your own testosterone. Right. And it's just other side effects as well, cholesterol changes, blood lipid changes that emanate from the liver that, that anabolic steroids have deleterious effects upon and SARMs do as well. So that's, that's so yeah, they, uh, these SARMs were a lot of money went into the development of these. Mm -hmm. Many good ones were developed, but they were only so good and they never reached the promise that people were hoping for. And so none has ever been approved to hit the market anywhere in the world, as far as I know. Welcome back to the Smarter Hunter podcast, your home for one cent solutions to $64,000 questions. I'm your host again today. My name is Dr. Scott Scher, and it's a pleasure to be back with all of you. Today, my guest is Patrick Arnold. Patrick has a storied history in the performance space, and he has not been without controversy, but extremely interesting conversation. Here's a quick bio on Patrick. So he is a seasoned organic synthetic chemist with a track record of patent and innovations, both active and expired. Recognized contributed to impactful pharmaceutical research articles in high impact journals. So Patrick is well known for his work in steroids. He is known for pro hormones. He invented something called 1AD, something called methyl hexanamine. And he's also known for the designer steroid market, including THG, along with the Balco professional sports doping scandal. So we talked about this in detail. He's also known for his work in ketones as well. And Patrick is a organic chemist still working in Illinois and in Connecticut. So in this particular conversation with Patrick, we had a very interesting conversation about multiple different topics. We spoke about steroids in detail for the beginning of the conversation. We talk about some of the trials and tribulations that he's had in the steroid world, making steroids, being involved in the Balco and other scandals and going to jail actually for three months at that time. We talked about who should be taking steroids and the challenge with making a designer steroid, um, making them less androgenic and more anabolic, which is a big challenge and sort of the holy grail. We talked about SARMs in this context for a little while as well. After speaking about steroids for a while and understanding why the regulatory boards are so up in arms or were so up in arms back in that time frame with steroids and something that he developed called clear, which is something that didn't actually show up on drug tests. Then we decided, then we changed our conversation over to ketones, ketone metabolism, uh, the formation of ketone esters and ketone salts and how he was involved with Dominic Diagostino for a while in this world. And then we finally transitioned over to talk about NAD. We talked about some polyphenols and chocolate that he's very interested in and some of the experiments that he's doing with alcohol and other kinds of things. Uh, especially with NAD. And so this is a really fantastic and overarching conversation with Patrick. He's a very brilliant chemist and has lots of great ideas. His world and his career has not been without controversy, but you have to appreciate what he's been able to do with steroid chemistry, ketone chemistry, and now NAD and others. Enjoy the episode and talk to you soon. All right, All right Patrick, how are you today? Hi, Scott. How are you? I'm good. So thanks so much. I really do appreciate you spending some time with us today at the, on the Smarter Not Harder podcast, where we really try to interview people that have done amazing things in their life. Um, doesn't matter if it's been controversial or lack thereof, but certainly yours has been, your life story up to this point has been very controversial at, at times uh, because you've been trying to push the envelope. And in fact, so much so that you, I think you spent how many months in jail? You said three months. Is that right? It's just three months, yes. And then the rest, was it on probation or how long were you on a probationary period? I had two, I had, after that, I don't remember how many weeks or months I had of house arrest. Okay. Could have been another three months of house arrest okay. or something. And then I had two years of probation. Two years of probation. Okay. And so it's... It, it, when you're living in a life where you're trying to push the envelope with things, um, especially when you're doing things that are very novel as you have, like it's amazing, unfortunately, you know, the, the sort of the power of the government seemed like to came, just kind of came over you and you didn't have much of a choice, but to go to jail, it sounds like, even if you didn't do anything wrong. And I, and I think that that's really what most of us in the world of, you know, of health and wellness really believe uh, that you didn't do anything. And it was, you just were made an example of, unfortunately, because of other very high profile people like 
Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire and others that were breaking records that they never they never would have broken except if they had found if they hadn't been able to get access to some of the things that you had created. And you didn't, and I think that what's interesting is you didn't do that. You didn't make these things for that reason. And I think that's where I really, where I want to go and start off with is because you're very much known for the world of steroid chemistry and how you were able to create various compounds in here. Um, I think one of the ways I wanted to start off this and asking this question is why do you think people are so afraid of steroids? <laughs> And why were they so afraid of them back then, you know, uh, and when you were doing all this work? Well, I think that when steroids first came around, people start people's first exposure to anabolic steroids as in their role in athletics were looking at these people that were ex extraordinarily muscular for their time and, and for the, the, the people that they competed against. You couple that with these women, for instance, from East Germany back in the 70s and 80s, I don't know if you remember, but they were quite virilized, masculinized. And that was a shock to people. Those women that looked like they needed with, with five o'clock shadow, mm -hmm. and, you know, big <laughs> bulky shoulders and that are that are killing it in, in the track and field. It was shoving that shop, you know, way far, farther than anybody else. And that um, just looked very unnatural and just artificial and kind of scary, kind of uh, you know, like a sci-fi movie or something. Sure. And then it's, I think another uh, milestone moment would be when Ben Johnson broke that uh, world record at the Olympics. Right. Now, everyone was taking steroids. We know now, I know at least, Carl Lewis and other, everyone else. I mean, I'd say it, but Ben Johnson got caught and Ben Johnson was particularly responsive to them, or he was just a particularly muscular person. And he broke the record and it's controversial about what may have happened, but he got caught. Other people did not get caught. Mm -hmm. At that time, a lot of positives were brushed under the table, not Ben Johnson. And it was a disgrace and everyone at the time, I wouldn't say everyone, but, you know, not 99% of the people out there were like, okay, well, Ben cheated. Everyone else did. Well, look at Ben. He's so much bigger than anyone. So he has to be the only one that was doing that. Right. It's not the case, but and it, that stuck in people's memory. And that kind of laid a foundation for how people perceive these, these drugs. And then it came around with baseball and the steroid scandal, steroid age, I guess you would call it. And these guys up there at the plate are pretty damn huge guys. And not only that, but you look at Barry Bonds. He went from a skinny guy to right. an extremely bulky guy that just hit that ball so hard. <laughs> you know, he'd, he'd almost miss and he'd hit a home run. You know, it'd take a pop up. <laughs> but so that was really, um, that's why people, that's just a, it's divergent thoughts on right. it. Some people are like, oh, this is great. It's so entertaining. I want to go out and see these monsters hit the ball so far. It's a great thing. And then people are like, this is just hideous. All my, all my heroes, Ruth and Aaron and, and, and uh, Mickey Mantle, you know, they, they were pure American good guys. And this, this is just so wrong. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a little silly, in my opinion, but that's how people think. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. I think that people always think that the past is better on some level. They have this rosy picture of what happened in the past. That's always better than what's happening in the future with, with progress and, or with changes. And I think, you know, steroid chemistry is a big, big part of that. And you've been involved and you were involved for many years in, I, I think initially you started off in the bodybuilding world yourself, taking these correct. And then you started making them yourself. What brought you to the point where you started, you started wanting to make them yourself or, or find ones to, to make yourself. Well, I, my first job out of college, I was in a lab in New Jersey. I was, had a very boring job and I set up a reaction that was a polymerization reaction. All I had to do was put, add a free radical catalyst every half hour, hour. And my boss was just not there. 
and there was really nothing else to do. And I wasn't very proactive in doing things that would have been for the benefit of the company. So I just did things that I wanted to do as a mischievous youngster. Got it. And that would include making, researching the manufacture of, of uh, recreational drugs or things that are fitness related because I was into going to the gym and the enhancement, whether it be nutritional or pharmaceutical was interesting to me. So there was a library at, on the floor where I was at, good, pretty well stocked chemistry library. And I did a lot of research into all these things. And I figured out how to, how to make some simple anabolic steroids. I was able to order the chemicals through the company, the precursors, mm. and then react them to make the actual drugs themselves. Okay. And so while you were doing this, were you looking to just create molecules that were already, already well established or? Were, yes, you, I, I was, yeah. I was just making the simple things, uh, methyl testosterone, testosterone, uh, methyl dihydrotestosterone, and then a few more, uh, esoteric ones, uh, something called oxymethylone and stenozolol. Yeah. I made all these, they, they all went on a certain trajectory of, you know, one, could convert to the other and sure. And I followed some of those pathways and I made various amounts of a lot of things. Got and it. I, and there were different precursors that would go to different, um, classes of the anabolic steroids. Like there's a 19 nor class and, and, uh, and there's some other ones, the 13 beta ethyl class. Mm -hmm. And what was the goal with all the, the sort of the variability, the variable ones that you did, were you trying to find like the perfect one that was, you know, androgenic, not androgenic and more anabolic, or is that, I know you've well, talked about I, that a lot. There were certain books published and a lot of articles published. The books published were more research compilations. They would just look at all the literature up until that, the point that before that person book was published and they would review the steroids that they knew had been made and what their properties were, whether it be anabolic and androgenic, androgenic being the masculinizing properties and anabolic being the supposedly pure muscle building properties. Right. But not only that, but there was a lot of other uh, variable, variable properties that people didn't know at the time, such as propensity to convert to estrogens or or cross reactivity with mineral corticoid receptors, mm -hmm. which can affect uh, salt and water retention. So all these had different, uh, above and beyond just their muscle building effects, a uh, whole slew of other secondary effects or tertiary effects. What was the whole so thing? Go ahead. And I always thought that, you know, oh my God, there's got to be the perfect steroid out there. And then some are better than others, but they really are just playing with the same class of compounds. You're not going to get that much variability. Understood. So I, and that's kind of what my question was going to be. Was there ever, so the, what was the sort of the holy grail that you were looking for? What was the ideal steroid that you kind of never found, but we were, we're always looking for? What were the, the properties that everybody wanted on the perfect steroid? I would say that it would, it would be a very powerful muscle builder without excessive water retention, which can lead to fatigue. It could lead to high blood pressure. Right. It could hinder performance. One that doesn't make you, and also can make you too tight or just too too heavy. One that does not cause distressing psychiatric issues. I guess some steroids, it's just this one called halotestin or halotestin mm. that, and I think it might, it might interfere with um, enzymes or receptors involved in cortisol mm. metabolism and cortisol activity. And it, it seemed to cause very agitated state in the mind, or mm. it could be a GABA related thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Whereas other ones, such as uh, one of the most well known ones, is called Dianabol. Yes. That one generally gives a very pleasant feeling. People do not, there's no like worried rage associated with that, okay. so to speak. So I would look for something that would do everything positive and nothing negative, essentially. And yeah. There's a whole list of positive things and a list of negative things. Yes. And there, and there's really no perfect one. It sounds like, but a lot of this was sort of dose dependent is what I understand as well. Some of these steroids worked really well Absolutely. at lower doses. Uh, what was, uh, as far as, um, looking at sort of brain neurochemistry with some of these steroids, I know that there's some, 
knowledge that some of them in fact kind of interact with the GABA receptor. Do we have any sense of which ones worked on the GABA receptors more, most significantly that you were that you knew of, or was it kind of not well, really clear? My research, as far as steroids go, steroid hormones in the body and the GABA receptors have to do with mostly endogenous steroid hormones. Okay. Uh, DHEA, DHEA would be an example mm -hmm. of a GABA A antagonist. Antagonist, a, right? Antagonist, right? So when you take it, it actually causes a, you know, you get a little bit more neuroexcitatory effect because it's it's uh, your your GABA glutamate um, the ratio or balance, yeah, altered. Yes, it's going to be a little, little bit more excitatory. Yep. On the other hand. Progesterone metabolites, especially five alpha reduced progesterone metabolites, are known to be GABA. I don't remember exactly. I don't know if they're actually GABA agonists or they may bind to a site on the receptor, increasing its affinity for GABA. Sure. So it's one it, or the other. But either way, increasing GABA. Sure. Yeah. Yes. And there's one in particular called allopregnanolone. Right. Five alpha allopregnanolone that is. Pretty potent. It's right up there with your uh, benzodiazepines as, as far as its effect, pharmacological effect. And has it, so that's being affected on the GABA receptors themselves. Yeah. So that is a when a woman's uh, cycle, there's a certain period in their cycle. I think it's um, right before. It's, it's definitely not during the premenstrual period. In fact, the premenstrual period may be a reaction to previous progesterone elevation right. and, and and an abundance of these uh, GABA promoting right, progesterone, metabolites. Right. Sure. Yep. So there's a period in a woman's cycle where she feels good and relaxed and then then boom, the progesterone goes down. Right. Their mood goes south and what we you know, whether a man or woman, <laughs> we both know what that's like. Yes, of course. Yes. You, you're either as an objective observer or a subjective self. <laughs> yeah, understood. Yeah. Yes, I think neurosteroids, I mean, we know how neurosteroids themselves have a profound effect on multiple receptors, but including the GABA receptors as well. So, so, I, so yeah, I, I agree with you that um, understanding the biochemistry of our own endogenous neurosteroids is really important because they all have effects on the GABA receptors, which, you know, for those that don't, that don't know, I mean, have a significant effect on the breaks of our neurologic firing, right? So GABA is really important for inhibition of neurologic firing and, and, and also have uh, effects on anxiety and stress and helping with sleep and, and things like that. So I know that I, at least I've heard some of these sort of more synthetic, uh, uh, steroid derivatives have had people stay up for days, for example, more have more like a stimulant effect. Others will have more of a relaxing effect kind of deal. And, and as you were developing some of these, um, you were developing ones that were already on the market. When did you decide that it was going to start, you're going to start making your own and, and kind of looking into making your own companies with even the ones you did, you'd sort of derived, um, that are already described before. Okay. So. I would like to separate that into two different steroid type compounds sure. products. The first being pro hormones. And that's where I originally, when I got into the nutritional supplement industry, I introduced the concept of pro hormones. Yeah, let's talk about what pro hormones are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, at that time, dihydro epiandrosterone, DHEA, was being sold mostly to people that would buy them from overseas pharmacies and get it shipped to the United States. And a lot of people, Took them for, at that time there was no cure for AIDS, and and people would use these products as supposedly to enhance the immune system and and uh, or for physical effects, energy, I, et cetera. I sure. And I had during my research into steroids come across androstenedione, dione, which was a precursor to testosterone, two hydrogen atoms away. And the East Germans had used that, and they actually had a patent on it. Mm. So I remember when I started working in the nutritional supplement industry, I thought back to Anderson Dion. I said, okay, if people are selling DHEA, this is almost the same thing. It's a it's, DHEA actually converts to Anderson Dion. So I think, well, this is not a controlled substance. It's not a drug. It really has no classification. And at that point, period of time, there was the Deshay Act, which was the Nutritional Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act mm -hmm. of 1994. Mm -hmm. 
And many interpretations of it suggested that there would be no impediment to marketing Andrew Dot, just like there was none to marketing DHEA as a supplement. And at that point, 96 or so, it was being sold as a supplement. So I introduced Anderson Dial, expecting my doors to be broken down at any time. It's kind of silly if you think back about it. Mm-hmm. But it was a ballsy move because a lot of people, I've told some people I was doing this, and they were like, oh, you're not going to do that. You're going to get in big trouble. Oh, you're going to be in big trouble. Never did. Suddenly everyone else starts selling it. And then I went on to making other pro hormones, uh, interesting diol, and then these one, which is the, before to a position of double bond, one androstene diol, one is androstene diol. And these were progressively more and more potent mm-hmm. precursors, but they're all naturally occurring one degree or another. So you have those, and that's those were sold um, out in the open and through a supplement company that I had called Ergo Farm, and they were also sold, and we actually manufactured that some of these ourselves and sold it to bulk. It sold them in bulk to other companies. We then marketed all, yeah. it on their own private label. Right. And these were now, all pro hormones. Yeah, these are all the pro these hormones. Are, and, these are the, these are the pro hormones. And so maybe you can just define what a pro hormone is. I think you mentioned, mentioned it briefly, but I think that this is something that we, I think, now know of relatively well. But why, do, why did you think that these would not be regulated compared to some of the other products that you were looking at? Well, that's why I mentioned DHEA right. because that was marketed without any uh, up, uproar, you know, without any interference and no one. So I figured this is not any different than DHEA. Legally, there's really no differentiation. So I said, if they're not going to come after this if they're not coming after DHEA. And I was correct. And then, of course, that kind of broke the dam. And then you just kind of, everyone's rushing for this, that one, and that one. Right. But a lot of people would start selling things that were not pro-hormones or that were not natural. I see. And that's, the, you know, that kind of, and we're talking about an interpretation of Deshay at the time. Yes. Uh, the FDA many, many years later said, okay, well, we didn't mean it this way. And they had all these caveats about the very ambiguous law that of everyone course. would interpret it to their own benefit right. or to, uh, you know, or for, from a regular over-regulation regulatory standpoint, yeah. the FDA would interpret it. So, so that they, those became, uh, that became a very popular and lucrative segment of the supplement right. industry, and, specifically yeah. the sports supplement right. industry. Right. And the argument there was that these pro-hormones are naturally happening in the body, right? So that and there's also some sort of governor on the wheel, right? You only can make so much of these if you're taking them because of the other steps in the process, correct? Yeah, that was that was how it was presented, that these are, have a, there's a self-governing, as you would say, mechanism in your body and that's the enzyme availability yes. so it's only so many of these can convert to the active hormone and much of it will stay in this inactive precursor or pro-hormone form right yeah and that's i think that's the argument that i've heard as well so so one ad was your interesting interesting dial was sort of your most potent of these that you made correct one interesting dial yes that was that that reached a level where it was comparable to many prescription anabolic steroids, not, not some of the really, really potent ones, but some of the, uh, it was as good as a muscle builder as many of these more milder anabolic steroids, just primo bone. I would say it was, it was at least as good. Yeah. And at, the, at the correct dosage, of course, all the, everything, all drugs, the dose makes the poison and the dose makes the, the- the, the uh, difference, yeah. Positive effects too. So yeah, no, I get that. Okay, and so that was sort of one of you wanted to break down the question I, I asked you a little while ago into sort of two sections. The first was on the pro hormone side, and that's the one AD story. Uh, what's the other side of the story? What's the other aspect? Well, the other side of the story is something that when I was researching antibiotic steroids to make all antibiotic steroids, whether they be naturally occurring or not, I came across a bunch of ones that had been researched, tested, at least by some in ailments, some only in animals, and shown to be quite effective, 
but for one reason or another, never did make it to market. Mm-hmm. And I was always interested in some of these, one particular called norbolethone, which is very closely related to a female hormone, a progestin found in birth control pills called level norgestrel. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's actually the precursor to norbolethone. Now, another thing I thought about, because I was familiar with athletic events and the doping testing and how they detect anabolic steroids, which are specific to the compounds and or their metabolites. Okay. I knew that certain ones, because, you know, both of them was the first one that kind of jumped out at me, would not be detected because it has a, a, a structural anomaly on it. Okay. And that's this, this uh, functional group, the uh, 13 position on the steroid rig. Okay. And it's an ethyl group as opposed to a methyl group, two carbons as opposed to one carbon. And so every, and that's a part of the structure that does not change uh, in metabolism of the parent compound. So that will stick around. It will be there as the parent compound. It will stick around all metabolites and that will throw everything off because you'll be 15 uh, Daltons, whatever, of molecular weight off every okay. time because you have an, an, an extra uh, carbon and mm-hmm. it's associated hydrogens. Mm-hmm. Got it. And so then the, as a result of that, um, was that your, that sort of spurred your interest in looking to create these products because of their potential from not coming up? Yeah. In- well, I, you know, my mind was clicking. I was like, okay, you know something, boy, if I was an athlete and I was subject to doping testing and I had access to something like this, boy, that would really be valuable to me. Sure. If I was, so inclined to go there, so to speak. Yeah. And I, of course, there are people that will go there, as I found out. And I don't remember how exactly I met the first people that I did this with, but I, I had no trouble because actually people would come to me and ask me about the pro hormones. They say, oh, if I take these, will I test positive or can I take these and skirt a drug test? And people would ask me that. And I said, no, don't try to skirt a drug test with the pro hormones because you'll probably fail. And at one point I said, yeah, but there's these other things. And then there wasn't very long after that. And I started making this stuff. Uh, one of the companies that my company had a joint venture with called Metrics, um, the owner of Metrics and his, his uh, sidekick at the time, and I would hang out and talk about stuff. And, and I told him about this norbolethone. And I said, you know, I could make that stuff. And I think it's really good. So it works really good on paper. And I said, if I had this level in the gestural, I could, you know, I could make that stuff. <laughs> and so I, I'm out there in wherever they are in uh, California. I don't remember where it was. So I come back to Illinois. Next thing I know, there's like 100 grams of level gestural in my mailbox. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm like, holy Dang, I mean, that's that's a lot. I mean, if you were to buy that on the market, you spend tens of thousands, ten thousand dollars, I don't know, and it showed up for free. And I <laughs> I never even I mean, and for years I started was making Norbolethone and I never went through the whole damn thing. It's it ended up in a trash at one point. Wow. But uh yeah, I started making that stuff and I started distributing it to people, and next thing I know, I everyone Hear, people hear about it. People want it. Right. People have the emails. And, right. And this is where all the, the, the celebrity trainers start getting a hold of it and started using it with yep. their clients. And this is where it all kind of went down for you in the sense, because these were the, called the clear products, correct? That's what they were calling them? Yes. Yes. That was the first iteration or whatever of the clear. And there were two others after that. Gotcha. And so what was the, the sort of the, the culmination of all this for you was obviously the jail sentence and, and the whole market sort of getting shut down by, was it the FDA at the time? Or talk a little bit about that. We don't have, I don't want to talk about it in too much detail because it's not that interesting. I think for people, I want to get over to your work in ketones and NAD because you have a lot of other cool things that you're doing. But I think I'd like to try to re- sort of wrap it up a little bit in the sense of what was sort of the, what kind of came down, what, what happened at the end? to Well, to I... There were the two things, and they were kind of parallel paths, okay. and they both affected one another. Or my work with the undetectable steroids, the clear derivatives, that kind of thing, that leaked out 
in part because I made a big name for myself with these pro hormones. I did the def, DEA did not like the pro hormones. I see. And then word got out somehow leaked out that I was also making these these hormone. I was making steroids that people would use to cheat. And one person that I was or my girlfriend at the time was giving it to her. It was a track cyclist, and she just would not. She took too much and just. Ah really freak people out and they they um popped her for nabolathone and at the time i had switched to another one called thg tetrahydrogesterone and but she did not heed my warning and did not switch to tetrahydrogesterone and i had heard through this the guy i was working with one of the many people i worked with but probably the most well known his name is victor conti mm-hmm. He had an inside guy at the lab at UCLA that said that they're on to Norbolithone. And so Victor told me, and that's when I came up with THG, but this woman did not heed my warning and she continued to take Norbolithone and she got in trouble. And then I got a call from the reporter at the Washington Post asking me about Norbolithone, busted me, just, just chasing me down like I, I think of the... <laughs> the Incredible Hulk series, or sure. you know, they chase down Bruce Banner. They yep. press, and he runs. <laughs> I'm running away. Like, leave me alone. And it was kind of, it was really starting to scare me. But yeah, and then that um, kind of led indirectly, maybe to the demise or hastened the demise of the pro hormones as well, which which just FDA did not like them. They, they said this is not what we had in mind when we agreed to the the uh, text of Deche as written by Congress. And we interpret it much differently. And so we got to get rid of these pro hormones. And they decided to, by con- a Congress, a bill in Congress that was signed by the president to make these products controlled substances along with other classic anabolic steroids. Mm, wow. And that put it, and what, for the most part, to pro hormones. Got it. And then the whole thing with Balco, Victor Conti, and his just ostentatious um, pr- promotion and, and distribution of, of those substances that just led to, and then Barry Bonds just being a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. The IRS guy obsessed with them to, to, to bring them down. Yeah. He isn't paying it, taxes. You know, right. Yeah, so yeah, that's It, diver- it converts yeah. into just a disaster for me. Yeah. Basically. And it sounds yeah. like, I mean, you were just making these things. It wasn't you giving them to, to athletes. It wasn't, you know, you weren't. Well, I did, I did. I, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to come across as, as a complete saint here. Okay. Okay. And we have to understand that there's, it's a, it's a murky ethical area. Yes. And some people will say, okay, well, you know, these athletes, you didn't kill anyone. It's a victimless cl- crime. And I said, well, you know, you might look at it as a victimless crime because no, no one got hurt by these things because they, they were taking, I mean, the, the athletes that compete, they don't take them at dosages that are going to cause physical harm to them because basically when you take steroids and they cause physical harm, you are hindering your performance. Exactly. Yeah. And plus these people do not want to take too much of these things. They want just enough to enhance performance. Right. So yeah, it's, I think of it as victimless. However, you look at it and you, you think about the competition, you know, someone takes these things and they can win a gold medal. Well, how about the people that didn't have access to it? who got beaten that may otherwise have won the gold medal, you, you might look at them as victims. And it's like I said, it's murky ethical area. Sure. It's not like you're, you're killing someone or, 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 or to sexual assault or anything like that. But people, it's, you know, very, people have varying opinions. And, and they're allowed to, fair. right? And I think, I think that's okay. Right. Because I think that <clears throat> there are so many that people that are working in the gray area and doing a lot of great work, right? Doing a lot of great chemistry, doing a lot of great work with clients. I, I, I spoke to somebody earlier today, a clinician that works with mental health patients and does everything out of the box, taking them off their antipsychotics and giving them red light therapy to their brains and giving them methylene blue and, and all these other things. And like people like that are also vilified because they're out of the system, but they can do great work and help a lot of people. So I think I'm totally cool with the gray and I, and I appreciate you've been in that world for a long time, Patrick. And I know that you kind of transitioned from, I guess my, my last question for steroids for one, one more question there before we move on is, you know, there's, 
there's obviously a lot of things available now on the black market, the research chemical side, uh, the research, and even though a lot of these markets were shut down many years ago, they still exist, as you know. Um, if, if everything you know now from all the synthesis that you did, all the pro-hormones, like what advice like would you give people that are thinking about taking anabolics overall? Do you have like a general sense of what you would, I mean, because we know people are gonna do these things. I mean, whether it's for a movie role, um, and this is how one of my colleagues got involved in doing some consultations for this in the sense of like working with, with, with um, actors that are getting huge for roles in movies like 300 or something, right? These people are not naturally that huge, of course, right? So, right. Um, but in general, like if you, do you have any sort of recommendations for people as to, you know, where they would want to start or go or, or just what to think about. I mean, you don't have to talk about well, dosing or anything, but just some ideas there. It's, it's very tragic that the, uh, um, our lawmakers took these drugs out of the hands of responsible physicians that would have, in a different world, prescribed these for cosmetic uh, anti-aging purposes. Right. Longevity. You can't do that. Right. You will go to prison. I've known doctors that said, oh, okay, why can't I prescribe nandrolone decanate to my chiropractic patients? And this one guy actually started doing that. And, well, no, he, they caught up to him. And well, he, he did his life. His career did not end well, so yeah. put it that way. So, yeah, I mean, people need to know how to navigate the world of performance enhancement, enhancement whether it be – anabolic steroids or peptide hormones, such as growth hormone, or a lot of these quite effective growth hormone secretagogues, secretagogues, as they're called, right. that are available on these research chemical websites. And they work. And they, there's also selective androgen receptor modulators, or SARMs. And these are non-steroidal androgen receptor agonists. So the kind of steroids that aren't steroids, but they do the same thing. They uh, work via the same uh, genetic pathways that anabolic steroids do. They activate the same genes, deactivate the same genes that lead to muscle growth and strength. But people, there it's, they have to figure it out for themselves because you you cannot either that or they hire some trainer, you know, to kind of clandestinely leads them along. Like you said, these Hollywood athletes, and I know some people that, that do the diet and the training and, and the anabolics for these people that mm -hmm. get into tremendous shape yes. for these roles, they can afford it and they know who they have access to these people, but your average person does not, and they cannot go to the doctor. They cannot go to a, a, uh, co a, a cosmetic surgeon or, or someone that even that does the anti-aging medicine, though that is, well, I, that's not necessarily true because a lot of anti-aging doctors do use testosterone yes. replacement yes, testosterone and replacement. growth hormone replacement and, and under the guise of that, okay, you, you're optimizing hormone levels as you, uh, that are declined with age, so right. growth hormone right. and testosterone and, and other hormones as well, thyroid hormones, right. which is fine, but they only can legally optimize. They can't give you super physiological doses and make you into a bodybuilder looking person necessarily. They can make you look fitter, but not, you know, gross, <laughs> grotesquely huge. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that when I, there's definitely a, there's a longevity component to these, right? I think, I think what you're talking about also on the chiropractic side that you with the chiropractor is that, you know, sarcopenia is a big problem. Wait, wait, no, actually he was not a chiropractor. No. He was a cosmetic surgeon. Cosmetic surgeon. Okay. Gotcha. Yes, yes. Yeah. But in any regard, using things that are kind of going, going to prevent sarcopenia are a big deal, right? Sarcopenia is the muscle loss as we age. And so we do have more, um, anti-aging doctors, if you want to call them wellness doctors that are using things like testosterone and, and DHEA and, and growth hormone and using those. Um, but I think that you're right. I think it's difficult to navigate this. If you're not looking at it for those reasons, if you're looking at it for, for strength, for, for, for performance, um, how do you cycle them, how you stop them, what kind of dosing, um, I think it's really, it's a real challenge out there. Uh, and what is your sense of SARMs in general? Do you think they're relatively safe or do you have any experience with them? I. Yeah, I mean, I know people that have done them, and I tried them myself. 
they do behave like anabolics. However, they, they are not like steroids without the steroid side effects as people originally were hoping. Right. They do have the same hepatotoxicity or liver toxicity because they are oral, oral. And they also can, they also will shut down your own endogenous production of testosterone because your brain senses them as testosterone or testosterone like molecule and decreases the signal to your testicles to produce your own testosterone. Right. And it's just other side effects as well. Cholesterol changes, blood lipid changes that emanate from the liver that, that anabolic steroids, um, have deleterious effects upon and SARMs do as well. So that's, that's so yeah, they've, uh, these SARMs were a lot of money went into the development of these and mm -hmm. many good ones were developed, but they were only so good and they never reached the promise that people were hoping for. And so none has ever been approved and hit the market anywhere in the world. As far as I know. Right. They're still just on the, uh, on the, on the black market. They're or just on the research, research chemical research side. Chemical so side. These, are, yeah. these are basically investigational new drugs. Right. I guess that's a classification for them. Right. Okay. All right. Well, let's transition over because I think the first time I heard about you actually was not on the steroid side. It was actually on the ketone side um, from my colleague, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino and some of the work that you were doing there <clears throat> for a long time. I think it might be interesting to talk about so the evolution of understanding ketone metabolism and understanding ketones as products and how we could use them. So maybe you can give us a little bit of a backstory there and talk about um, the first couple that you developed and maybe some differences between esters and salts. And we can go through that a little bit because I think this is really important. I know I remember when this all came out in 2015, 2016, and trying to wade through this stuff, um, learning about it with Dom and with you and some of your early products as well. So, um, and then on the performance side, this certainly is it's definitely a, um, a through line for you from the steroid stuff to, to ketones, because that's probably what interested you in, in the first place. I'm guessing. Yes. I, I can give you the backstory yeah. and yes, they interested me. And that was a big part of why I decided to embark upon the research into developing ketone precursors, but it would never would have happened if it weren't for Dom, Dr. D'Agostino contacting me saying that he needed a chemist, a uh, contract manufacturing chemist or, or a, with a lab yep. that can make uh, research quantities of a ketone ester that was developed by a doctor, I think, I think his name was Brunenbager, and it was a uh, diacetoacetate 1,3-butane diol ester. And Dom gave me a old synthesis for it, and I did a lot of work on it and I fine tuned it mm -hmm. and made him, well, I, I made him a mono ester and I made him a diester and he decided to work with the diester and he got some very, uh, remarkable results with him first in, in regards to oxygen toxicity right, uh, and seizures yeah. with rats. And that was kind of sim a simulation for the application of uh, what Navy SEAL divers, divers undergo when going down with a rebreather. Yep, 100% under rebreather. Under yep. pressure yep. and oxygen under pressure, and they get a very large exposure to oxygen and they could seize. And so that's a big problem. So you want to increase the latency to seizure or the time it takes for you to actually seize from elevated oxygen levels in the blood. And the ketones seem to do that. Certainly, according to the rat studies, they did it quite efficiently, dramatically. The rats were fine in the oxygen pressurized chamber for much longer than the control rats. Right. And then he went on to do other research with it, uh, metastatic cancer. Yep. You know, they would uh, give the cat rats a tumor uh, that's highly metastatic. And some they would feed ketones to, some they would feed a bad diet or a regular diet or, you know, all these different groups. And the ketone ester really seemed to uh, put the kibosh on metastases of, the, of that tumor. And that's another great win for Dom. And he, he ended up getting that, you know, he really made his career off of 
these exogenous ketones. Right. He really had hit the jackpot as far as his theories were correct. No, the theories originally espoused by the uh, guy that developed the compound in the first place and then later expanded upon by Dominic. And so I made that form. And over the years, I kept making more and more ketone ester and I got better and better at it until I stopped making it. But what, what, <laughs> but, yeah, so to go through that a little bit. So, I mean, so my first understanding of ketone esters came from the study that he published on the combination of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, the ketogenic diet, and um, a metastatic model of, of glioblastoma, which is a brain cancer. And, he, they were, and then in correspondence, they did additional studies where they used the ketone ester as a way to help people so they didn't have such a restrictive ketogenic diet because the, the restrictive ketogenic diet yeah. is very challenging for even animals, but very, very challenging for, for humans even more so as, as you know. So um, as you were going through the development cycle of the ketone esters, kind of what made you, you said you got better and better at it. Like what, what got better? How did you improve upon it? What did well, you just do? The, yeah. the synthesis, pro synthesis process. Okay. I cut out some steps where it really weren't necessary and that were quite laborious and I came up with basically what you might call a one pot synthesis. One pot. Um, I didn't have to, you know, do a, just a huge distillation step. Uh, it didn't have to do solvent, uh, solvent removal step and all these things kind of, yeah. And yeah. that as far as Dominic's research and the, and the physiological properties, it's no, they did no effect upon that, but it just made it so the stuff could be made more readily and cheaper. Well, that's, that's really important because I mean, back in 2014 or 15, when this is all coming out, maybe this even earlier with Dom, what was the time frame you guys started working together? Was it around that time or earlier? I think it was around 2010, 2011 yeah, when sense. he first approached me. And then, yeah. and, uh, I think his first paper, which would be the ones with the rats in the pressurized oxygen chambers. Must have come out 2011, 2012. Yeah, that makes sense because he had the he still has the grant for the Office of Navy Research and do or naval research doing the the work on the DARPA, yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah. The, or the naval, yeah. Yeah. So, where did you have a sense, and and maybe it's more of a dumb question, and we can always skip it, but in the sense of why the esters were so powerful in this capacity, in the sense of like why they were working so well. Well, I discussed it with with, with Dominic, and Dominic's theory was that it was because they were based heavily on acetoacetate. And when they broke down on the body, it, it led to a large amount of acetoacetate being released. So as your ketones, two endogenous ketones are beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. Thank you, yeah. So the acetoacetate to BHB levels were, ratio was much higher. And Dom's theory was that acetoacetate has more, much more of an anti-seizure effect in the brain, whether it be due to acetoacetate or partly due to its its uh, its its spontaneous breakdown of acetone, he thought that you know he thought that something to do with it too. Mm. But it's true because the BHB ester, which was another ester, Dr. Veach's ester, yes, that did not work in the or did not work well in comparison in the uh, seizure models, right. And so the BHB ester, was that something similar to the salt or is that like an ester that had a BHB attached? No, that was a, that was a, I, also an ester with 1,3-butane dial. 1,3-butane okay. dial is a precursor, metabolic precursor to BHB. So I see. for instance, the BHB ester would break down into one part BHB and one part 1,3-butane dial, which then undergoes to oxidation enzymatic oxidation reactions, uh, dehydrogenase reactions to one, three, two B, uh, BHB. Got it. Okay. So it was creating more BHB. So maybe changing that ratio that you're describing. Yeah. So yeah. when you do the BHB yesterday, you're getting a lot of BHB and the only acetoacetate you get is from subsequent conversion in the body of BHB to acetoacetate. I see. With Don's ester, right off the bat, you get two parts acetoacetate released and one part butane dial, which then has to go into go enzymatic uh, trans transformation to one uh, BHB. Gotcha. That's actually, I didn't know that about the acetoacetate ratio. That's really interesting to me. And then I'm glad you made the point that these are the two main ketone products, the acetoacetate and the beta hydroxybutyrate. <clears throat> these are what, you know, fats are breaking down into. I didn't even realize, I didn't realize that one, three butane dial converted into acetoacetate. It can do that directly or how does it? 
Yeah. Well, okay. okay. So you know the metabolism of ethanol? Sure. Yeah. Alcohol. Ethanol converts to acetaldehyde. Yes. Acetaldehyde converts to acetic acid. Sure. Same enzymes. Okay. 1,3-butanediol converts to a 1,3 or a, a 3-hydroxybutanol, which is, or, or, or 3-hydroxybutaraldehyde. Okay. That then converts to an extra oxidation, takes aldehyde to the car, carboxylic acid. So that converts then to beta hydroxy or 3 hydroxybutyric acid. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I like the I like the chemical stuff. So I'm seeing them in my mind as you're as you're saying that. So good. That's I, the way it's supposed to be. I appreciate. I wasn't good at organic right. chemistry. It wasn't for me. The confirmations and the things. But um, I had a bad teacher. That's what I always said. I had a really bad teacher that, that just wanted to teacher fail. Teacher make a big difference. Yeah, I, my teacher when I was in organic chem and. I went to UCLA actually for undergrad. He just, he hated doctors and didn't want anybody to pass. So uh, it was, it was not, it was not a good you know, team. Guys like that, they, there's a special place in hell for them. I know. know? He, he actually, they want to make it hard for everyone. Yeah. yeah he'd come well, in. They feel special. Yeah, yeah. Like he would even come yeah. in the morning. He'd stay up all night at the lab. Then he'd teach us a class at eight o'clock in the morning. And, and just, yeah, he was just, he was a terrible human being, but, um, so I didn't learn much organic chemistry, but I, but the funny thing yeah. is, you know, learning now because of the, the companies that we have and, and the work that I do, I just, it's really great to understand some of this so that you can understand really like where things come from. Right. So especially in this case, but I, I know you guys also, did you also get involved in salts with, with Dom or do any salt? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, since I had a, I sold supplements traditionally and right. had supplement company, I was interested in a supplement alternative to the ketone ester. Right. And it, it made sense to me that, okay, well, you can make a salt of beta hydroxybutyrate or BHB. Right. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot make a salt of, well, you can make a salt of acetoacetate, but it's very unstable and it's, it will over a short period of time break down to acetone and whatever else I don't even remember. But so BHB salts were commercially available, extremely expensive, available as research chemicals, uh, particularly sodium BHB. Okay. So I looked into possibility of buying these in bulk. They were not available in bulk, so I developed a synthesis, synthesis for them. I see. From a, 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 a quite cheap available precursor, synthetic precursor, and a, and a pretty simple reaction. And so we started making BHB salts at my facility. We had a huge dryer, vacuum dryer mm -hmm. oven, and we would manufacture the salts in solution, a solution that ended up having being water with some ethanol. And then we put the, the, the slurry in trays under vacuum and heat, and it would dry to the salts. And we made sodium salt. We tried to make potassium salt. The potassium was so hygroscopic, which means that it yep. just picked up so much water, much water. Yep. from the air, you could never dry it. It would actually turn into a liquid. If, if you got it dry enough and put it out within a day, it'd be a liquid again. Gotcha. You know, it just sucked up all the moisture from the air. We all, but we did make a, a calcium salt. It's a little harder to make, but we were able to do that. A magnesium salt could be made, but it's just not worth it. It's hard, and plus you can't take too much magnesium. You'll go running to the bathroom. Sure. So we decided we're just going to make calcium and sodium. That's the keto canna product right. we took was calcium and sodium. Right. Yeah, no, C, A, and N, A. So then uh, we started making this for a multi-level marketing company called Prove It. Yep. We made their salts. They became very successful and so we made a lot of the salts for them but as we figured since we had no patent protection or anything on this intellectual intellectual property protection they eventually found someone to make it in china for cheaper sure. and <clears throat> kind of got cut out of the whole thing but you know that's happened to me before of course it's reality it's just, yeah you know, yeah no one's going to be loyal to you yeah to their own detriment yeah so it's i mean competitive yeah. dog eat dog world out there yeah no i get so, it yeah yeah yeah, my question on that would be, I mean, I think 
probably many people know and understand, but why were people so interested for, for, with ketones and performance in general? What were they noticing? What was the, the effects that were, that were having in the performance? There was a world? lot of confusion back then. I think people have a little better handle on, on, on what our exogenous ketone is and what it can do and what it cannot do. But a lot of people associated ketones with the ketogenic diet and them being a breakdown product of fat metabolism. You go on a ketogenic diet, your body switches from using glucose as a fuel to using fat as a fuel. The end result being an accumulation of these uh, end, end, end stage product called ketones, uh, which can be used as fuel in the body. Mm -hmm. In some cases, they're kind of a super fuel, especially for the brain. So people thought, okay, so the ketogenic diet makes you burn fat. And so, well, I, I should take exogenous ketones and I'll burn more fat. No, no, that's not the case. The fact that the ketones go up when you're on the ketogenic diet is not, has nothing to do with the ketones themselves. The fact that your body, the end stage product of fat metabolism are ketones. So people started to sell these saying they burn fat. And that kind of really upset me because I said, you, you're going to disappoint a lot of people by giving them a false a promise and they will get burned out and these things will say they don't work mm -hmm. because they, they also can do a lot of other things. And for a while there, we, there was some research was done on per, uh, performance and endurance athletes. And, and there was some effect there. It wasn't particularly dramatic, however, fortunately, but I think where they, um, all exogenous ketones really shine is in their effect on uh, a, a mitochondrial um, health effects on preventing cancer, which is a secondary uh, benefit of the mitochondrial mitochondria being healthy mm -hmm. and brain function, uh, brain balance of, or brain energy. Uh, uh, neuroexcitatory um, suppression, or you know, right, controlling the neuroexcitatory excess, and other things such as that, and and of course cancer, as if, which is also a side benefit of, of mitochondrial health. Um, yeah, I would have said that, but no, that's okay. I, I was gonna I was gonna circle back there anyway because I know that it's so from my perspective. Um, you know, using the ketogenic diet, using ketone supplements has been very, very helpful, especially working with people that have cancer. Um, we're looking at a metabolic approach to it, looking at as, as the, uh, the mitochondria being a significant sort of main role in all of that. I think that's great. And I, I think I've seen a lot of benefit over the years now that there's a lot more products on the market, uh, a lot more interest in the nutrition inside as well. So the nutritionists are doing ketogenic diets with their patients um, and working with cancer and seeing some significant benefits. So I think there's a lot there. And I agree there's a lot on the performance side too. And and I, I remember some of those first claims about fat, fat loss. And I was trying to figure out, I remember re reading the claims. I'm like, how is this helping you burn fat? <laughs> you're just getting, you're taking ketones that are the I fat know, byproducts. It's, it's, but... it's a complete misunderstanding of, yeah. of everything. But they're fuel, right? They're fuel. And I think one of the things that, yeah. that we do know is that ketones are great fuel for your mitochondria. They're, uh, they're more efficient fuel than glucose under most circumstances. And that over the long term, our bodies get less uh, efficient at using glucose, but our efficiency for ketones stays about the same. Uh, and that's, that's a really big benefit overall. Yeah, you you can actually generate more ATP per mole of from ketones than you can from glucose. Right. And you just per, per, per mole of oxygen. I mean, you consume more oxygen per unit of ATP when you burn glucose as opposed to burning ketones. Right. It's much. It's a much cleaner fuel for that reason. And so we talk about this and, and there's a, there was a huge emphasis in ketosis and ketogenic diets. I think things have sort of evened themselves out now a little bit over the last several years. I mean, we had everybody from, you know, Ferris and Atia and all these guys that I, that I know of or know, um, that were doing lots of ketogenic diets. But I think now the key is, I think people are kind of more balanced in their approach, understanding that metabolic flexibility is likely the better idea, being able to go in and out of ketosis and, and, and maintain energy production, whether you're in a fat feeding state or a fasting state. And, um, this kind of leads me to your, 
your like the, the last part of our, our conversation, which will be around some of your newer interests, because I look, you've had this you know amazing career with like brilliant chemistry, you're doing these amazing things. Um, and you know, I, I'm especially aware of the ketone side and my colleagues, especially we're on the steroid side of things. Um, but so tell us about some of your newer interests now, Patrick, you were telling me a little bit before we started about some of your interest in NAD and precursors. Um, what's really interesting there for you and what do you think is going to be sort of new and upcoming in, in your world as you think about this stuff? Well, currently I, I'm not doing research. I'm not developing chemical syntheses because I, I no longer have my lab, my business. Um, then the, I've never did uh, research as far as bio, uh, biological research like Dom does on on, on animals, on, on rats and, sure. and such. That was never my thing. I always would collaborate with somebody right. that did do that stuff. Makes sense. Like yeah. Dom, perfect example. Right. But I, my own personal interest in anti aging and general health and performance and feeling good, looking good, and and having a clear mind it's brought me to NAD supplementation, the work of Dr. Sinclair and, and, and Sir Tuins. Sure. I, I remember reading about that many, many years ago when the initial research on resveratrol came out and the whole concept of Sir Tuins and their dependence on, on NAD as a cofactor in, in their uh, in expression of the genes. Um, so then you know, spiritual still out there, but then it, 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 NAD got the, uh, itself became the, the focus mm -hmm. and it's administered the administration of precursors to NAD, which, are, which can be absorbed orally and can convert in the body, uh, in the blood or the cells. I'm, it's a little iffy as to how it actually works. The enzymes are known, but where the conversion takes place sure. is, a subject of debate, I, I suppose, but we do know that NAD activity does definitely increase in the body in several uh, tissues, brain, uh, possibly muscle, or just a little iffy, but in liver for sure. Right. Um, one interesting thing, I don't want to go much too much into it, but I did discover that very large dosages of not, uh, NMN, which is a precursor, administered use the term parenterally, can completely prevent alcohol intoxication and and even not, uh, consuming large amounts, and this is not recommended for anyone, of alcohol with while large with large amounts of NMN, therefore increasing NAD levels in the liver and supercharging the dehydrogenase enzymes, which I mentioned before, causes such a rapid metabolism of alcohol that you can actually drink a lot and not <laughs> blow much more than a 0.03. Interesting. This is I don't, it. yeah, it's, I didn't really want to mention it. That's okay. I mean, but it, I just, it, it's it, just such a, it's just such a dramatic thing right. that, you know, you can see it working in, in such a way that's so definable and quantifiable. That like, there's no question in my mind that this stuff is amazing. You know? And you were taking That's, this is an NMN, this is NMN IV or a sub Q or what did you? Uh, have? It's uh, intramuscular. Uh, intramuscular, okay. Which is which is not, which is not a way, not a very convenient way to deliver. And in, intramuscular in is never a good, never a convenient way to deliver anything. No, it yeah. does. I mean, you, it, it gets a little, you get a little sore after a while. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it was just kind of a proof of concept kind of thing. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so I mean, look, you, you have to do these experiments to understand what's actually working, and I think sometimes it's hard to know. Um, especially something like NMN, because people are taking these supplements all the time now, and they don't know if they're working. If you're taking, if you take NMN, and you take NR. Do you take, you take NAD? Do you take? It's all subjective. Yes, you can't you know, actually subjective. look at something and say, "Oh, that's evidence on paper, a number to say that this stuff is doing as advertised." I would call the yours a challenge it. test, Patrick. You did like this is a challenge. Okay, I know what this hypothetically should do. Let's see if it actually Let's works. See if it does. <laughs> that, I mean, that's and that's what you've it's done. It's a little insane. Yeah, that sounds like that. But that's like your that's your ethos, man. It sounds like like if you're going to try something, you're going to see if you can get an effect, right? And that's in. Well, I'm, I'm I'm very impatient, and I want to know now. <laughs> yeah, I got that. I got that. And so, look that that there's a nice 
capacity for you to be able to to break a lot of steps in the in the process. Like, I want to know what this this is going to work. I have the understanding of the synthetic pathways. Let's let's try this and see. So you're playing with some of these um, these precursors. Are, are there any that are, that are very interesting to you? Like, I think you're mentioning before we started something about one of the polyphenols specifically that you're looking at. Yes, uh, that is not uh, NAD okay. related. Okay. But it is all, also a natural compound, uh, epicatechin, which is found in cocoa. It's the main polyphenol. Polyphenols are a class of compounds that include flavon flavones, isoflavones, um, catechins. There's this, there's this many others, mm -hmm. but they all have these uh, phenol groups in them, which are benzene rings with hydroxyls on them. Uh, some of them multi multiple hydroxyl groups, uh, phenol groups, that's why they're called polyphenols. And this, this one epicatechin is the one that's most abundant in chocolate. And it's also pre quite abundant in green tea. Mm -hmm. And research has shown that it's, it, several things. It, it is extremely effective in cardiovascular health. It, it causes vasal relaxation and it increases nitric oxide mm -hmm. synthesis, which causes uh, vasodilation. It also has an effect on your body's consumption or your body's preference to what, what it's going to burn for fuel. For instance, they gave a dose of epicatechin to subjects for eating a meal, mm -hmm. obese subjects and uh, normal subjects, and they found that it caused a great increase in the fat and the burning of fat after a meal, and also a decrease in blood glucose and less glucose burning, more fat burning, and that was you know obviously it has tremendous effects. If you take take something like that before you eat, right, and you know your blood glucose is controlled and you actually burn more fat after eating a meal, which is not something you normally see, but another thing that it does that I, I found quite interesting is, is that it affects uh, gene uh, genes related to the synthesis of two hormones, um, or you could call it cytokines, or I, I don't know exactly what classification there are, but one called follistatin and one called myostatin, mm. and they seem to work in conjunction. Follistatin goes up, myostatin goes down. Now, myostatin is the key here. That is the negative regulator of muscle mass. And so your body is always producing a certain amount of myostatin, which inhibits or hinders or puts the brakes on muscle growth. So if you take away myostatin, your muscles will grow more because right. the break is released uh, in muscle growth and all the other things that promote muscle growth will be more effective. So... And it does that quite effectively, and it's been shown multiple times in research. So I, I'm very interested in that. Very cool. And I've been experimenting with ways to administer that, and I've decided that you has to you have to reach a certain dose where subjective effects become quite apparent. And a lot of times, these things that work on paper uh, people have great hope for don't work in real life. And a lot of times it's just because, well, they're never going to work in real life, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's because people just never took the right dose or the right route. I think of this dose, is right. one of those yeah. things where you yeah. got to take the right dose. And I've been experimenting with, um, I did all kinds of ways of administration and I decided I, I just want to do it orally. You know, I don't want to fool around with anything else. Sure. So I was able to get a significant amount of the material so I can afford to do high doses. I two grams a day to me. I I think you really you can feel it. It's a difference. Okay, and and I, just for people that are listening, the the myostatin knockout gene. So this is something that has been well known in the muscle world forever. These are the people that are gigantic, or like the bull knockout, like the the uh, they took the thousand the blue cattle yeah the, the, that's that's right the thousand of cattle that's right yeah, yeah. so yeah the like the gigantic cattle these are the myostatin knockouts so when you don't have myostatin no fat, all muscle. you're just you have zero fat and you have all muscle so yeah. i think it's 
I didn't mean to take away from the NMR conver- or the NMR, that that conversation because I thought that was interesting as well. But this is like this is a really cool sort of circling for you, right? Because in the sense of like you're looking for other compounds that are helping with muscle building, and of course have lots of other qualities as well for like a longevity anti aging perspective. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And my two areas are brain health, muscle health, and I think that the two. They go together. You shouldn't separate the no, two because yeah. they both kind of are yin and yang. They work in conjunction. They're synergistic. Yeah, for so sure. I effect, so yeah, I, I try to address both. Yeah. What's your What's your favorite um, uh, What's your favorite um, NAD precursor right now that you're playing with? Well, I've never tried nicotinamide riboside NR. Okay. Uh, I've only tried nicotinamide mononucleotide NMR. Yeah. NMN. However, there's something going on in the regulatory yes. world because somebody, I think, made a drug application Sinclair. for NMN yep. for a particular, particular disease or something. So the FDA suddenly says, oh, well, you can't sell NMN anymore because somebody's having it developed as a drug, which I find I find that to be a little dubious, a little, you know, not 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 kosher yeah that's that uh, you the, can't take, say, say something okay so somebody wants to develop this as a drug now yeah. something that's been openly sold as a supplement suddenly can't be anymore. yep yeah this is and yeah. i know that amazon is abiding by the fda's opinion letter on this and the fda is still up in the air they haven't had a final opinion and they seem to be stalling because i think that they know that what they want their opinion to be is just going to not fly yeah and it's going to they're going to get backlash and you know when people have challenged the fda before effectively it, it's really made embarrass them yes so they just want to turn turn away and just ignore the whole thing but the nic- nr nicotinamide riboside is not being developed as a drug so that is still available you can sell that on amazon uh, can't sell on a man so um from a this viewpoint of where well, you can't find nmn a lot of people will sell nmn you know, and they're not being harassed or anything, but you know, these, these big companies, Amazon, ones like that, they, they won't touch it. Right. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. But NR, I don't, I don't know if the, if the one is more effective than the other, but I, I think the NR should be just as effective. It's and then NR quickly converts to NMN in the body, which then converts to NAD. So I think they're all, you know, the, 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 the two should be comparable. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, cool. This has been great, Patrick. Thanks so much for spending some time with us today. I think that your knowledge is just, it's crazy how much you know about everything we've just described in so much detail. And we just kind of scratched the surface. I'm, I'm really interested in your new projects, or at least your new, <clears throat> excuse me, your interests, at least in, in, in NAD. And I think longevity and also um, some of these poly- polyphenols sound really interesting. Now, I ask this question to everybody at the end of the podcast. It's a question that's sort of like a more of a global question from like um, the, the ethos of our podcast, which is that, you know, we ask every, every guest, you know, what are the three ways that you can live smarter, not harder? Um, and this could be any three things that you describe. It could be anything from your personal life to professional to anything in between, like the three things anybody can do to live a better life, you know, smarter, not harder. Do you have any ideas? Well, I would say all in moderation. Okay, I like don't that. Try to, don't try to look for answers by doing extreme this or that. Like, I don't know if it was on this podcast or a short conversation we had beforehand, but a lot of people are, are so into the ketogenic diet that that's, they think that's all you have to do all the time. Some people may have to do that because of very you know, Cancer or particular something. health sure. concerns. Yeah. But yeah, I think try this, try that, and, and don't do anything that, that is so inconvenient to you that you will never be able to sustain, sustain it. Sure. Uh, you want to live a happy life. You don't want to be miserable and healthy. I don't think the two even could go hand in hand. Right. Agree. So I agree. I, I think you definitely need to get enough sleep. Okay. You should have a good sleep wake cycle. Get up early. Uh, avoid stress. Don't don't let the little stuff drag you down. It's a hard thing to say, but you have to find the people you hang out with, the places you go. Uh, the way you format your life. I love that. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Make sure all that stuff works for you. And, you know, you'll, you'll, your body will thank you in the end. Got it. So moderation, 
sleep yeah. and stress. Those are great. Those are perfect ones. Yeah. And you know, I talk about that all the time in my own clinical practice. We talk about that at our nonprofit that's training doctors and practitioners that like, these are the things that everybody needs to do or else no matter what you try to do from a supplement perspective or a diet perspective, nothing else is going to work or not work very well. And then if sleep is not going well, then you know everything else goes out the window too. So um, well said, Patrick. Um, where can people find out more about you? If there's any websites or any place you'd like them to, to go to, whether it be uh, online, Instagram, LinkedIn, any other places that they can find out more about your work? Well, I... I have, a, I have a Facebook page. Um, okay. I, I have a, I started a, I used to have a blog and I, it ended and now I re resurrected it. Excellent. It's one word, Patrick Arnold blog. Dot com. I think, um, cool. Hmm, it's on the, it's a, a Patreon app. Uh, I, I don't know if you can find it through Patrick Arnold blog that, you know, I should have prepared. That's okay. You can send me the links afterwards. We'll, we'll grab them. No worries. You know? Um, yeah, maybe yeah. you could put up a, a picture of the link. Yes. Um, no problem. Yeah. We're happy to transcribe it or whatever. Yeah. We'll get it. No worries. Yeah. No worries at all. So yeah. Thanks again, man. It's been really nice to speak with you and, uh, I look forward to chatting more at some point soon. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of the Smarter Not Harder podcast, where we give you one cent solutions to $64,000 questions. I had a fantastic time speaking to Patrick Arnold. I hope you enjoyed listening to his worldviews, his steroid synthesis pathways, his history, NAD, polyphenols, and ketones in between. If you like this podcast, please share with your friends, like, and subscribe below. We can't wait to have you for another episode soon. Have a great day. Yeah.